My guest today is Professor Dean Brinson, who had a near-death experience, and he's here to talk about that experience today. Professor Brinson, welcome, and thank you so much for coming on the show. You're more than welcome. All right. So tell us what happened, Professor. Okay. Let me give you a little background on myself. Uh, I have taught school in the Chicago school system uh, for about 17 years at all levels, elementary, high school, and also taught at the college level. But I was extremely curious for knowledge. All my life, I was curious. So I was never satisfied with the Western understanding of real knowledge. I always felt there was some knowledge deeper than what they talked about. So I traveled around the world many times, and I ended up going through Europe, uh, through different parts of the Middle East, Japan, and I ended up in India, and I fell in love with that country because they have so many spiritual uh, teachers over there and guides, and all of the religions of the world, major religion, come from that part of the world. We have imported them over here, and we think we know more than them. It's considered a third world country, and I was fortunate to come in contact with a high government official who befriended me, and he taught me so much about spirituality. He said he had a teacher at an early age which taught him how to consciously get out of the body and come back. That shocked me to my core. I said, what? He said, yes. This body is constructed in such a way that it has uh, nine doors on it. I said, what do you mean by doors? He said, actually, it's 10, but I'll tell you about the nine. You got two eyeballs, which are apertures, which are holes, which captures your attention and takes it into the physical world. You have two doors at the earlobe level. These are holes, which you hear sounds in this world. It captures you and holds you at the physical level. Then you got two doors at the nostril level, where you breathe sense into this world, all kinds of odors. And that holds your attention into the physical world. And then you have a mouth. And that mouth does too much talking. <laughs> so I laughed. So you, <laughs> you should listen because you got two ears. You can learn more. When you talk, ask questions to someone who has higher knowledge. And that person can teach you. I said, you just told me it's possible to get out of this body. I'm still fascinated. He said, yes. But these doors are holding your attention. So far, I've described, he said, how many doors have I described? I said, seven. He said, but you got two more. One at the reproductive organ and one at the buck docks. Most of the men in this world live at the reproductive organ. All their attention is flowing down there. You ask the women and they'll tell you. That's what they want. And then he described, you have to be able to re reverse the flow of your attention from outside into this world to inside. And the creator or the universe has designed this human body in such a way that it is possible. And so he went into detail and he said his teacher taught him how to do this. So uh, I would practice uh, and I'll go into that after I had my immediate experience back in 2019. I'll come back to the experience. But when I was uh, going to the hospital in 2019, 19 in the spring, uh, my wife insisted that I go and get a colonoscopy. And we got into a small argument. Uh, I was supposed to get a hip surgery. I said, I'll get one uh, later on. She said, well, at least get your colonoscopy done. So she made the preparation for me to see a colonoscopist at Rush Hospital, which is near downtown in Chicago. So as we proceed, she put me in a wheelchair and she was acting very courteous and ladylike. So as we go up to the fourth floor in that hospital to see the colonoscopist who was supposed to do a colonoscopy on me, I said, well, I don't need this. She said, keep your mouth closed. I said, look, I've been eating plant-based food for almost 50 years. All of my organs and veins and arteries are as clean, no cholesterol, and as pure as the snow. She said, keep your so-and-so mouth closed. You know how wives can get after you and argue. So I was quiet. So as she wheeled me into the fourth floor of the hospital room to see the colonoscopist, 
I quietly and noiselessly had a heart attack. I didn't even feel the heart attack. I died. And the Rush Hospital got all of my records concerning this experience. And as I died, I found myself out of the body, looking at the doctors who my wife had got into a panic state and called everybody. Strangely enough, the universe had provided a cardiologist to be on that floor. He was not supposed to be on that floor. And so he got gathered some nurses and people around him. And they asked for a different instrument to try to resuscitate me. And I was watching this process. They cut off my expensive coat that I had worn. And I tried to grab their hands. My hands went through their body, just like in the movie Ghosts with Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore, and Whoopi Goldberg. Because when you're in that body, you are a ghost. They can't see you. You can hear them. As a matter of fact, you can actually read their thoughts of what is going on in their mind. We try to do this in this world, but we block by the inhibiting factor of the grossness of this physical body. These senses in this world are restricted. So as you get out of this body, you discover that the untetheredness of the soul inside the physical body gets released and you find yourself in an astral body. So as I got into that body, I was with my friend whom I had met over 40 some years ago who had experiences and taught me earlier how to do this. But when I had this heart attack, he came, he met me and he said, what are you doing? You know, you can't play with these people. They can't hear you. Let's get out of here. So we, he chaperoned me. We flew through the roof at tremendous speed. I said, I want to see the sun. So we went to the sun and saw all of the nuclear explosion taking place. Great heat coming out. You couldn't feel anything. He said, why are you wasting your time on this boring experience? You experience the sunlight every day. Let's get out of here. So we flew beyond the sun, trillions and trillions of stars and planets and galaxies. And we entered the astral plane. But before we entered that plane, we went through a tunnel. And in that tunnel, there were human beings that I had met and known in the 1600s, 1700s, even earlier. And I didn't know everybody, but some were coming back through that tunnel and they recognized me. And they gave me a name which I had at that time and I acted like that was me. I knew them. And they said, uh, if you're going this way, we come in that way. We understand that. Uh, I, said, Where you? I said, I'm in America, Chicago. Well, that's where we want to go. And I said, they said, what's your phone number? Where you live? I gave them that information knowing that when they become a baby, they will get into a state of Alzheimer's, spiritual Alzheimer's, a state of unforgetfulness, okay? Every human being, I won't say every human being, but most human beings, when they take birth, they have a big deja vu memory. It's, I've seen this, I've done this, but they can't recall because the memory collapsing is necessary. That's part of the experience of making this world look real. Let me go into detail. And then I come back to the tongue. All of us go to sleep at night. We normally in the wakeful state of consciousness, right behind these two eyeballs in the head. If you were to uh, take these two fingers and, and go back here in the back of them, it would be like a pyramid. You know, you cross them, that's the pyramid. That's where that door, that tip door lies in the body. But it's very difficult to open. It is fastened bolted down tightly and it takes a lot of concentration of attention with a teacher or a guide in the physical world because we don't learn anything except from a teacher. You wouldn't even know how to use the potty if your mother didn't teach you. You wouldn't know how to take a bath. You wouldn't even know how to walk if you just saw people crawling around. We learn everything from teachers, elementary school, high school, colleges. But when it comes to this type of awareness, Beyond the physical state of awareness, we have to meet a teacher above that state. So I got fortunate. <laughs> you know, uh, I've met this teacher and he taught me everything that I'm sharing with you today. But when I went through the tunnel and met these people, I went beyond the tunnel. We went into the middle part of the astral plane. It's a gorgeous, beautiful, fantastically huge, gargantuan world. If we were to compare the astral plane with all of its beauty 
and uh, the beings that are there, it would appear like a like the Pacific Ocean. And our physical universe, with its trillions of stars and galaxies and planets, would appear like a quarter, the size of a quarter in the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean being the astral universe. Everything in the astral world is lit up. Your body is lit up. My body was like a golden color. Everybody that's in that world is highly intelligent, highly knowledgeable. Um, they're beautiful beings. There's no violence taking place there. They don't experience any pain. And if you, as he took me around, I saw some of the people there. They're scientists working on different projects there. So when they take birth here, they look like they're making a the discovery. <laughs> They've already investigated the knowledge there. All of the knowledge that exists there is percolating through individuals in this world. Everything. So uh, you can meet sports figure who are practicing their craft. And they become great people when they come into this world. There's so much knowledge. You don't have to uh, study books there. It's a tedious process even in this world. But all you got to do is look at an object. You can look at a tree. And you can see how long it's been there. You can see a little bit into the future, what's going to happen to it. You can see the whole history of everybody to some extent, depending upon how much concentration or skills you develop in this world. So uh, everything is lit up. Knowledge is easily acquired through infusion. You just look and it comes inside you. Time there is different from in the physical world. Space is huge. Time is different. What do I mean by time being different? I'm going to go back to the physical world and give you an, an example. When you're in the wakeful state, the state in which I'm talking to you now, you feel this human body is yourself. And you wake up every morning. You don't have to pinch yourself. You don't even have to open your eyes. You feel you are awake. You feel you are awake because memory comes back into you immediately. Oh, I've been in this body 30, 40, 50 years. However old I am, that memory comes back. Therefore, you can write off the dream world, which lasted for just a few hours of sleep. But when we dream, three things happen to us. Because the nature of consciousness is made this way. We immediately create an illusionary body, which we give to ourselves. We don't look at it, but we're conscious in that world. And when we move in that world, we also create space and time. The space looks exactly like it does in this world. If you look into the sky, it looks just like the sky in this world. You can see stars. You can see airplanes flying around. You look at people. If you're walking in the streets, you see people working on projects. You can see a lady with a baby in a buggy moving around with a little newborn baby. You can see a construction worker on a ladder, older man asking for bricks from the younger man to send him up. So when you see these different forms and different aging, you start thinking it's time going by. That's the illusion that is created, that you create. And when you wake up, you discover that you created everything. You can even eat food there. You can drink different liquids, and they taste exactly like they do in the physical world. Consciousness has the capacity to not only create, but experience at the same time. Therefore, you can't tell what the causal direction. Consciousness is made with this feature to be creative because the creator created us and he's doing the same thing or she that excuse me that creative power is put his consciousness or her consciousness inside of us and it operates the same way we create the same way but we don't know how we do it he knows or she knows exactly how the process is taking place we operate out of ignorance that being operates out of knowledge and so let me go back to the astral plane as you, as I was in that world, suddenly my awareness came back that I was over 3,000 years of age. I can doubt it. Nobody doubts his or her age in this world. Even if the president, the celebrities, the kings, the rich people of this world came and told you, uh, Mr. Bland, that you're not as old as you are, you'll write them off, right? They cannot shake your knowledge because it's solid. You get solid knowledge when you're in that world. That world is a world of certainty. This world, you can have doubts. You can have a lack of certainty in many areas. 
Heisenberg said, the more you look at smaller forms of matter, you cannot determine the causal direction or the time frame. In other words, he was talking about the uncertainty principle at the smaller portion of matter. But that's another subject. So as I'm in that world and discovering that I'm over 3,000 years of age, I didn't mind going to sleep there, which came back to this world. Or you can say the process of dying there, but actually you go to sleep. Just like when you wake up from a sleep, you wake up here. You cannot die. Consciousness is permanent. You cannot die. It's like the creator. And you start seeing, you can go backwards in time. Time can be suspended. You can't suspend time here. You can hold on to an experience, just like a remote control, and say, let me explore it. Let me go back 2,000 years ago and see what happened. And you can go back and be in that time frame and watch the history. In this world, people write about history, but they can give their opinion. In that world, you can actually see history unfolding as a ghost watching it take place in that world. You can watch it. You can also go into the future to some extent and see what's going to happen, but not too far. So, but anyway, going back to the astral plane, my teacher said, let's get out of this elementary school. I said, what are you talking about? He said, this is the elementary school of the spiritual world. It's not a high stage. Most people who practice with a teacher, they end up going to the astral plane. Many of them don't go that far into the astral world, but those who go far, they think that's the highest because all of the spiritual regions are constructed in such a way that you feel is the highest. And there are beings there. There are spiritual administrators that control that world. Just like in this world, in America, you got a president. He has a lot of power. But you can't go meet him unless you know somebody who knows him well. They can take you and you can go meet him. In that world, my teacher said, I said, well, can I meet the president of that world? In this world, they, the Greeks used to call those gods, G-O-D-S. They were spiritual administrators. I'm modernizing the word now. They have tremendous power, especially the super god or the super spiritual administrator. He controls the destiny of everybody in the physical world. How long you will live, how much, how many births you'll take, how many lives you'll experience, how much money you'll make, how many divorces or how many children you'll have, what type of racial composition you'll be born in. That being is extremely powerful. But he said, let's leave this. Because if I see that being, that being is going to ask me how he can go higher. Okay. So we left that world and we flew to the causal plane. The causal plane, I don't know how to explain it. I'll try to come up with words because in the astral plane, you don't need words to communicate. You can use words, but you communicate through telepathy. Telepathy is a beautiful process where you say something in your mind and the other person who's communicating with you hear exactly what you're saying and they understand you. So there's no room for interpretation misinterpretation. But in the causal world, you feel you are one with everything. You can actually become one with everything. It's a fantastic experience. But there is an administrator there who controls everything from that level, everything below. And all of these administrators are only in those positions for a certain amount of time. In the causal world, the administrator is considered a god too. The real god has created levels of counterfeit expressions of himself. So people who practice and go inside from the physical world and see a God that says Jesus, Buddha, they being influenced by the experience in this world. They very seldom, if ever, ask that being, who are you? <laughs> they don't ask. That being will tell them the truth. But the being is looking wonderful and looking spiritual, in some cases with a beard. They say, oh, this must be Jesus or Buddha or, or some other spiritual, Mohammed or somebody. OK, and these spiritual teachers of the past only have gone so far from their teacher. You only can go as far as your teacher has gone. So as you cross the astral world, I, he chaperoned me. So I was just enjoying myself. We go into the causal world and he said, let's go beyond that place. And so we went beyond that place and we went into the world of self-realization. It's a beautiful world where there's nothing but love there. You, for the first time, feel you do not have to take birth again. You are saved, but you're still not at the highest level where God is. God is much higher, he says. God is two stages higher. And I said, can we go see him? He said, no. <laughs> he, 
not now. Because if you see him, you wouldn't want to come back. He'll give you so much love, you want to stay there. Even in this region, you want to stay. I said, yes. He said, but you can't stay. I said, why not? He said, you got children, you got cousins, you got relatives, you got different kind of peoples, you got duties to perform. And now I discover I have to meet you, Mr. Bland. <laughs> That's why I came back, okay? <laughs> so you brought me back. You saw all these people brought me back. So he said, you have to do some service. So after I had this conversation, the only explanation I can give for that world, you can say is not this, not that. The Indian world is nete, nete, not this, not that. You can't explain it. There's no language there. There's only love, love, and more love. So now let me go back to the experience I had in the 70s. Because my teacher taught me how to concentrate attention behind the eyes. The door, like I said, is about two inches behind these two eyeballs, like in a pyramid. Like if you got a dollar bill and you look at the dollar bill, that's an uh, African or Greek symbol of the third eye. It's a real symbol, but most people don't understand it's real. And if you know how to open up this door, which is extremely difficult, because people are practicing meditation by reading books, they're practicing by listening to radio, by listening to programs like this. Oh, let me try to go inside. Some of them can be successful, but it's dangerous. It's almost like trying to go to, uh, uh, like say if you want to go to North Korea. If you have knowledge, you wouldn't want to go there because they may kidnap you, right? So if you are unaware, there are spiritual highway robbers and saboteurs and cutthroats that try to rob you of your spiritual wealth. Some of them try to get inside your body and channel. So therefore, you need a guide. The guide can take you to these different meandering territories, huge worlds that you don't know anything about unless your memory comes back of being there before. So it's dangerous. So I would suggest find a teacher or get lucky. You only can find a, any teacher that can teach you and he has gone himself or she has gone, follow that teacher because it's hard to meet the highest teacher. You have to get lucky. Just like when a lottery is taking place in different parts of the world and if it's a billion dollars, everybody try to win the lottery. Take $5, $2, they start spending their money hoping that they'll be a winner, knowing that they won't. <laughs> and if they win, you can win with $1 and become a billionaire with $1 ticket on a multi-billion dollar lottery game. That's how I won my ticket. But it was won by seeking. You have to seek. And in the human body, that's the only experience you have of seeking. In the other bodies, you have no free will. You discover that free will is unreal when you get into the astral world. But in the causal uh, plane, I mean, in the uh, world where the Lord is, there's only two individuals that have free will. The human being out of ignorance because the human being doesn't know what he or she is going to do tomorrow. Oh, I'm going to go to work. I'm going to do this. You can die tomorrow in a automobile accident. You don't know. And the creator has free will out of knowledge. He knows exactly what's going to happen to everybody. Millions of years ago, he knew you would be sitting with a black shirt on. And he knew I would have a vest that says, I see. I that see. Right he knew all of this. He knew I would be born in a black family. He knew that you would be born in a different racial complex. So we tried to go back to our original home. And you're doing things that will help people get this awareness. I'm trying to share some of my experiences, which are exceptionally extremely exceptionally rare because the experience most people have is of the astral plane that's the heavens that's where all of the heavens and hills exist they don't know anything about that they get into heaven they say oh i'm in heaven they are in heaven but they go come back here and seek deeper what makes you seek deeper lessons that you learn let me give you a superficial lesson that most people know but they don't know until somebody tell them Say if you're in your automobile and you're riding down the road, sir. Everybody's had this experience. And suddenly you're surprised and shocked by a squirrel or a chicken running in the path of your automobile. Without thinking, sir, your first instinct would be to put on brakes. Every human being will say it. 
even people who kill people will, because the body has a DNA instinct which takes over and automatically reacts like a nonviolent species. We are a nonviolent species. You got 8,400,000 species been estimated in the physical planet of Earth. And they are all divided into two categories violent species, nonviolent species. The nonviolent species are made like human beings anatomically. Let me give you an example. We sweat through our skin. All nonviolent species, horses, cows, sheep, they sweat through the skin. On the other hand, the violent species, they sweat through the tongue. Wolves, dogs, cats, lions, they sweat through the tongue. The nonviolent species got flat teeth, just like we have flat teeth. And they're, they're meant to eat plant-based food. Now, that's a big shocker. I'll explain that. If you look at the cows, horses, and sheep, they will eat no meat. <laughs> They'll walk by, smell it, and walk away. No matter how well it's been cooked by a chef, how much it smells, they follow their DNA principle. We would follow ours, but we follow it when an animal runs in front of the car. Our mothers, our parents, they messed us up as a child. They gave us chicken, fish, ham, all kinds of meat, and we loved it. So we became like meat addicts, just like a drug addict is hung up on cocaine and he wants to withdraw, he goes and see a doctor. The doctor gives him some methadone. But there are foods in this world. You probably have it in your part of the world where, uh, I don't know if you got a Burger King over there, but if you do, they have expanded their plant-based food. They have an impossible burger, which you can't tell the difference when you eat it. It tastes just like a real hamburger made entirely from plants with no cholesterol. Plants have no cholesterol. Meat are saturated and overflowing with cholesterol, which can give us heart attacks, strokes, clog up our veins and arteries. So as we make progress in this area of food and nutrition, that's something that we have to learn in the physical world. But you do good action, you still can go to heaven. <laughs> but your karma will bring you back because you created pain either directly or through the uh, slaughterhouse being hitmans for you and wrapping these animals up in cellophane and you enjoy them. So you got to pay a price. That's a shared price for the people in the slaughterhouse and the people who slaughter the animals and for us who eat them. So at this point, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you to ask me questions or anybody in your audience. And I hope I share some experiences of mine. And I had this experience uh, back in 1970 when I was meditating. Uh, I meditated. And as he said, uh, the thing that comes in the way is our attention. Our attention is being cluttered by thoughts. We cannot be physically in a wakeful state without thinking all the time. Scientists and psychologists have estimated that over 60,000 thoughts go through our mind every day. So how to shut down thinking? When we get sleepy, we get drowsier and fainter, and the thinking process starts slowing down, and we drop from the sixth floor, which is the wakeful state. There are many floors in this body, by the way. We're on the sixth floor. Most of us live out our, out our entire life on the fifth floor, which is in this area of the body, the throat, or the fifth floor. I mean, the sixth floor. We don't know that the seventh floor is the astral plane. We only go there when we die. But anyway, in meditation, what makes you die? There are two ways to die, two techniques. One, accidental death, gunshot wound, strokes, heart attack, excessive trauma to the physical body, excessive pain forces you out. And nobody really wants to go that route because they don't know if they're going to come back. They don't know what's going to happen. And then there's the conscious way of dying. But everybody that dies will hear a strange noise. Your audience, if they want to read about this, they can get a book by Dr. Raymond Moody, who's a bestseller. He was on Oprah Winfrey in Chicago a long time ago. He's still living. And he went around to hospital and talked to thousands of patients who had clinical death experiences. And all of them who had memory when they came back into the physical body talk about a strange noise, which he mentions in his book. And noise is like a humming sound. It's like electricity going through a wire. It can like be like cricket sounds 
It takes on different sound. It can sound like the gushing of the wind, which Christ talks about in the Bible. I believe that's in uh, John, eighth chapter. Uh, I mean, the third chapter, eight to the twelfth verse. He talks about you have to be born again. When he talk about born again, uh, Nicodemus didn't know what he was saying. He said, how can I be born again? Can I enter my mother's womb a second time? He said, no, look at Nicodemus. He laughed at him and said, you have to, in essence, get out of this body and take birth and become a citizen in the astral plane. I'm modernizing the language. But Nicodemus didn't know what he was saying. Nicodemus eventually became a vegetarian after being around uh, Jesus. But anyway, going back to... Uh, this experience of getting out of the body when I was meditating in my closet, uh, I was having great difficulty. But I wrote my teacher a letter because I started hearing some strange noise. And one night, one night, I would get up at two, three o'clock and start meditating for four or five hours. You only had to do, he said, two hours, two and a half hours, which is 10% of your time. He said, God doesn't want any of your money. You can give it away if you want it for charity. When he said 10% tithing, he's talking about attention. Attention is the most valuable thing to him. That is your wealth. That is your wealth that you can use to go back. And as you develop concentration, you can take that wealth or that money to the astral plane and you can travel into the astral world depending on how much concentration or, or how much money, spiritual money you have. You understand what I'm saying? Just like you can travel in this world if you got millions of dollars. You can go all around the world several times, live in mansions. But oh, one thing I didn't say about the astral plane you can create houses by thinking there. You can make these houses can be in the sky. There's no gravity. You can put them on the land. People go and they see designers, and that world and designers can match, give them a mansion. They can get in that mansion and they can move around because you can just fly. You don't need an airplane. You can create vehicles for moving around in if you wish, but you can just fly and move at great speeds and go as far as your spiritual money will take you in that world. But anyway, I don't mean to jump around, but when I heard this sound, it scared the hell out of me. Because I started feeling like I'm getting out of the body and I feel like I couldn't breathe. I was choking. Then you get to a point where you don't have no control because that noise starts pulling you up like a vacuum cleaner out of this body. And it scared me. So I wrote a letter to my teacher. He was in India before he came here to visit me. But that's another story. And he said, look, don't worry. I will be there. I'm going to meet you when you get out. Why are you fearful? I understand fear, but get out one time and you'll lose most of your fear. So the people who have this experience, they hear this noise. And some of them have talked about in that book, it turns into a bell sound. The bell sound or a sound like a train going on a bridge. Boom, a loud sound. It pulls you out of the body and takes you into the astral world. But then there's another sound which takes you out of the astral plane into the causal world. Every level of consciousness has different tonal, musical, harmonious vibration. It's almost like water flowing through some rocks. It creates another sound, right? It flowing on sand, sand, it creates a sound. Through grass, it creates a sound. So as it goes through a different region, it's the same sound in the Bible. In the beginning was the word and the word was God. They're talking about that sound. God is like a vibratory energy. He doesn't speak to us in English or in Spanish or French. When he speaks to you, if you hear him, you're going to leave the body. Because <laughs> his voice is all powerful. He takes you up. You are his child, his children. You'll experience fear because nobody wants to die, not even a, a ant, not even a roach. So you have to learn this lesson while you're on earth to be nonviolent. Don't kill anything. Only eat that which doesn't run away from you. What doesn't run away? Strawberries, apples, oranges, peas, uh, all kinds of plant plants. That's what you're meant to eat. But you've been addicted. So if you're addicted and if your audience is addicted, there's a company in Illinois. Uh, I'm just going to flash this up. I hope you can see it. Nonviolent food and its effect on human attention. And the company that manufactures this food, uh, if you want to get in touch with them, is MiracleFoodsGlobal.com. MiracleFoods, with an S on it, Global.com. And you can change your eating habits. 
So at this time, when I, I had that experience uh, and I discovered my teacher had so much power and I was struggling with meditation in the 70s. And he said, look, as we were walking, when he came to visit me and we went to a spiritual frontier meeting in Pennsylvania. And as I was walking, he said, how's your meditation? I said, it's difficult. I said, I've been struggling for, for a few years and I haven't been able to get but the embryonic expression of that sound. And it scared me once. He said, listen, I'll talk to my teacher. One thing about these highly developed souls, they act like they don't have any power. <laughs> Jesus talked like that. I talked to my father <laughs> when somebody asked him to do something and he would play games. But anyway, he said, I'll talk to my teacher. You sit in meditation and see what happens tonight. So I went and sat in meditation. I said, I'm not going to do any repetition of a mantra because the mantra is to stop that mind from running all over the place. It's like a wild horse jumping on kinds of thoughts. And I just sat. Then the sound came and it got louder and louder and pulled me up. And I got out of the body and I couldn't go that far, but I went up to know that this body was not me. I saw my body sitting in a lotus position. So at this time, I'd like to turn this group back over to you. And if you have any questions or anybody in your audience, tell them to, they can ask me or you can ask me. So thank you for all the attention you gave me. And if they wish to get in touch with me, they can contact me. Uh, Professor Brinson, B-R-I-N-S-O-N. Uh, and I'm on YouTube, and, or they can go to the YouTube channel, I-Seek, S-E-E-K, dot org. Thank you for your unmerited attention. Okay, so I just have, I have one question for you, Professor, which is, well, actually there's two. Your friend, who your Indian friend who met you when you had your near-death experience, was he actually still alive, or is he already passed on? Oh, he passed away in 2000. Uh, 20. Okay. He was 94 years of age. All right. I was with him for about almost 40 some years. Okay. I've been on the spiritual path uh, about almost almost 50 years now. All right. That must have been, uh, you must be surprised to see him. Oh, yes. He said he'll be there. That's how these spiritual teachers, if they highly develop, that's how they operate. Wouldn't you rather be chaperone? You don't have to think and just ride like you were when you were a child and went to Disney World and your parents were there. But if you lost their hands, you would panic, right? Where they at? So as long as your parents are there, you can ride and enjoy yourself. That's how we need to enjoy this world. And you can enjoy all of the worlds like that. To have a chaperone who's highly developed and he goes along with you as you travel. And he's at the eye center waiting on me all the time. Full experience. So he was like, he was your spiritual guide, wasn't he? And I have one other question yes, spiritual for you, uh, which is about free will. So you mentioned free will. I'm not quite sure if I understood you correctly, but my impression was that you felt like we don't have a lot of free will or very little free will. Could you just talk a little bit more about that, particularly okay, our I experience here? It. All the religion said that God is omniscient, right? Which means he knows everything. He's everywhere present but we can't see it. He's in that vibrational form, okay? And he's all knowledgeable, he's all aware, he's all powerful. So if he knows everything, then he knows exactly what you were gonna do today. You know you're gonna have some ear, or uh, things over your ear so you can hear. He knew you were gonna be dressed in a black t-shirt. He knew I was gonna be black, a white t-shirt with a vest, eat with glasses. He knew all of this. So that means we don't have free will, but he did a wonderful trick. And it's easy for us to discover it just by realizing what I'm about to say. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next year. We don't know if we're going to be here. We could get shot by a drive-by shooter. We could get locked up in jail. We could get divorced. We could, anything can happen. But we have the feeling we can do what we want tomorrow. You feel in your mind, oh, I can go rob a bank. <laughs> I can go kill somebody. That feeling is there. And that's the illusionary feeling he gives us, which means he has made us in his image by creating an illusion. When they say we made in the image of God, they mean we made in the image of free as, as how we exercise will, not in terms of the body, 
but in the will. So any person of any religion will have to admit that God knows everything and the answers in that. But the mechanical process, I just explained. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but you feel you're going to go to work. You feel you're going to get up and get in your car. You feel you're going to say hello to your children. You feel this way, but you can have a heart attack and die and be in a casket in a few days, right? Or get burned in cremation. So he created a wonderful thing. So there are only two beings in creation that has the feeling of free will. The ultimate creator and human being. Human being got a, this feeling of free will out of ignorance. He has it out of knowledge. So he admires us. The angels are jealous of us because they don't have any free will. They can't even see God. They don't, they don't have to come back to this world to get the feeling to seek him. And many of them don't want to leave this beautiful region of heaven and come back. It's almost like you being a millionaire in Hollywood in a mansion, and then you go there, and that being may say, look, you say, I want to go higher if you meet such a high being. He said, you got to go back and live in the ghetto and catch it <laughs> and suffer. You said, most likely you said no, or you'd be born blind. But time would look different when you're in the astral plane. You know, 50, 60, 70 years, and you 35, 4,000 years of age, that look like you're going to sleep for a little while there. That's how you being bribed by those high beings if you meet them there. <laughs> Make sense? All right. I get I get what you're saying. Uh, Professor Vincent, okay. uh, I appreciate your, your time today and your attention. And I um, appreciate you coming on my show today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share this knowledge with any of your audience. And if they wish to get in touch with me, uh, they can. <laughs>